Thanks for the introduction, Sarah. It's great to be here. I um, just want to thank the organizers for the invitation to present this afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to give you a little bit of an overview um, on Voyager Therapeutics. It's uh, the newest entrant in the gene therapy space and um, a lot of exciting things to talk about. So uh, we'll jump right in. Uh, in terms of the high-level overview, the mission of the company is to build the leading AAV gene therapy company focused on severe CNS disorders. Uh, we're a private company. Uh, we were launched in February of this year. Uh, it was created by Third Rock Ventures in close collaboration with some leading uh, scientific and uh, medical advisors, our founders, and uh, we have the support of a $45 million Series A investment uh, from Third Rock. Uh, we have multiple AAV-based product programs. Uh, three lead product programs have been disclosed publicly, and I'll go into a little bit more detail on those in a minute. Um, one of the uh, key aspects of the company that we feel like differentiates Voyager from other AAV gene therapy companies um, that have been started over the past, call it, 12, 18 months, uh, is we're making um, a very broad investment in our product engine or, or platform. And there's really three key areas that I'll go into, uh, vector engineering and optimization, uh, process R&D, in production, as well as what we generically refer to as dosing techniques, and this is how we get the virus um, uh, into the body, whether it be direct injection into the brain or, or intrathecal delivery. From a headcount perspective, uh, we're about 28 total employees now. That's a mix of part-time consultants and full-time folks. Uh, full-time uh, headcount is 17, and we're headquartered in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. So patients are at the absolute center of everything we do at Voyager. Uh, it's really what drives us day in and day out. And everyone in the company is extremely enthusiastic about the potential uh, for AAV gene therapy to really have a significant impact uh, on patients' lives. And this not only holds for uh, severe CNS disorders that we're going after currently, uh, but other um, therapeutic areas as well. So two uh, big picture questions that we get most often, uh, why AAV, why CNS? Uh, on the AAV side, we feel like um, AAV as a vector has really risen to the top of the heap uh, in terms of the uh, vector of choice from an in vivo gene therapy perspective. Uh, there's been a significant amount of clinical experience. Over 1,300 patients have been treated in AAV clinical trials uh, with no vector-related serious adverse events. Important to point out that most of this has been with AAV serotype 2 to date. Uh, AV does not readily integrate uh, into the target cell genome. Depending on the context, this could be an advantage or a disadvantage from a CNS perspective. Uh, we view this as an advantage, uh, relatively um, low probability of random, random integration events. Uh, and from a uh, persistence of expression standpoint, uh, the target cells that we're going after in the CNS, the neurons, are terminally differentiated cells. So even though the AAV doesn't integrate, we're able to see uh, persistent gene expression after a single administration. So with our collaborators, we have data going out beyond beyond 10 years in non-human primates, out beyond five years uh, in previously compute, uh, completed uh, human clinical studies uh, where we see uh, persistent gene exp expression after a single administration. Preclinical studies show that you can get widespread delivery uh, using AAV throughout the brain and spinal cord, obviously important as you think about uh, CNS indication. And there's been a number of uh, recent advances in dosing techniques. Uh, here, talking about enhanced MRI delivery uh, um, that we're using as part of our Parkinson's program. Uh, lots of promising efficacy signals, both uh, in preclinical and clinical studies. And last but not least, um, what's really uh, evolved over the last five or six years is high-quality, scalable approaches from a production standpoint. So as one thinks about late-stage clinical trials, commercialization uh, for indications where there's a large large patient population or where you might need to deliver a large amount of virus to an individual patient, you know, having that uh, scalable uh, production platform is, is going to be critical. To that end, we actually um, had a key hire uh, before we actually even launched the company, an uh, individual by the name of Rob Cotton uh, from the NIH. He was a senior investigator there. Uh, he invented a baclovirus-based production system. Uh, it's actually the system that's used for the only AAV gene therapy product approved in the Western world. This is uh, Glide Bera. So Rob's on board full-time at Voyager as our head of production, really driving uh, that effort for us. 
We have an outstanding roster of uh, scientific and clinical founders. Uh, Chris Bankowitz from UCSF has really been a pioneer for AAV gene therapy in the context of Parkinson's disease and has helped driving that program forward for us. Uh, from an AAV biology and a vector engineering perspective, uh, Mark Kay from Stanford and Guangping Gao from UMass Medical School are working with us. Uh, Guangping, as I'm sure many of you know, did a lot of the seminal work to identify uh, wild type AAV serotypes that are really the focus for a number of the preclinical and clinical studies uh, that are ongoing. He's also a colleague of Sarah's, so that's always a benefit. Um, for some of our product programs, uh, we are looking at knockdown approaches. So Phil Zamor joins us uh, from UMass Medical School, uh, one of the real pioneers in RNA interference, one of the co-founders of El Nylum, um, and we're using his microRNA knockdown technology as we look at disorders uh, like ALS as well as uh, potentially Huntington's disease. In terms of uh, the leadership team that we've assembled, uh, this was one of our key goals for 2014 for the company, to get a full-time uh, leadership team in place. As some of you might be familiar with the uh, Third Rock model, oftentimes uh, Third Rock partners will serve interim roles for a period of time, 12 to 18 months uh, after the founding of the company. Um, proud to say, you know, here we're sitting in October and we have uh, the full-time leadership team in place. Uh, most notably, um, we had Steve Paul announced as our permanent uh, CEO just after Labor Day. Uh, Steve was uh, head of R&D at Eli Lilly for a number of years, uh, neurologist uh, by way of background. Uh, he was a venture partner at Third Rock. He was a founder of Sage Therapeutics. He was actually our interim president of R&D, so really helped create the company uh, while we were incubating uh, at Third Rock, and we're just um, uh, over the moon that he's decided to join us full time. Uh, the rest of the team is made up of outstanding individuals. Uh, Bob Petrusco is heading up our regulatory affairs uh, effort. He's actually wandering the halls uh, of this meeting. Um, just has a, a real uh, deep background uh, in, in tackling challenging uh, regulatory um, uh, um, hurdles, if you will, uh, from a drug development standpoint. Was uh, head of regulatory affairs at Millennium. More recently, the head of regulatory affairs at, at Virapharma up until the, uh, the Shire acquisition. Uh, Dinah Saw is heading up our neuroscience effort, uh, comes to us from El Nylum. Uh, Bernard Ravina joined us earlier this year as our head of clinical development, uh, came from Biogen, was an academic before that. Uh, he was associate chair of neurology at the University of Rochester uh, Medical School, movement disorder specialist, deep ties with the Parkinson's community uh, and the Friedrichs Ataxia community as well. Uh, Mark Levin was our interim CEO up until uh, Steve's appointment in early September, uh, has now transitioned to chairman of our board and is still intimately involved uh, with the company. So as we think about how uh, the gene therapy field could unfold from a, a high level, uh, as you'll see on the next slide, our, our pipeline is very much focused on traditional gene replacement and gene knockdown approaches. Uh, but we fully appreciate and are actually quite excited about the potential of leveraging uh, what we're doing from an AAV gene delivery perspective to enable approaches such as uh, gene editing uh, and, and antibody delivery as well. And what I'm referring to on the antibody side is the possibility of using an AAV vector to deliver a fully human monoclonal antibody uh, direct to the CNS. And uh, Steve Paul, um, as part of his academic activities at his lab at Weill Cornell, has really shown some encouraging preclinical data Data, where you can get um, levels of antibody expression in the CNS uh, consistent with what you see uh, post-systemic delivery uh, of an antibody via IV. And that's exciting for indications such as Alzheimer's disease, uh, FTD, and others. So this is just a snapshot of our pipeline. Uh, these are our three lead programs. Um, top of the list is our uh, Parkinson's disease program. Uh, this is in a phase 1B study at UCSF. It's an investigator-sponsored study, uh, not a Voyager-sponsored study. Uh, gene replacement approach, we're going in with AAV, uh, delivering the AADC enzyme. This is the key enzyme that converts levodopa uh, to dopamine, critical pathway uh, from a pathogenesis perspective. Uh, we're doing direct injection into the brain parenchyma, so it's a, um, a bilateral intraputaminal uh, injection in the these patients. Uh, it's a 10 patient study that's ongoing, two doses, so five in cohort one, five patients in cohort two, three patients have been dosed. Fourth patient, I believe, gets dosed uh, later this month, um, and we expect to have six month follow up data from the first cohort, call it the middle of 2015. So, pretty exciting times uh, from that perspective. Uh, from a preclinical product program, 
perspective, uh, we're uh, pursuing Friedrich's ataxia, traditional gene replacement approach. We're going in with the FXN gene that gives rise to a healthy version of the Frataxin protein. Uh, it's a monoge monogenic disorder, autosomal recessive, uh, you know, well-defined in terms of the gene of interest. Uh, here we're going direct to the CSF in terms of the delivery uh, using intrathecal administration. We're also looking at a monogenic form of ALS. This is the SOD1 mutation, so toxic gain of function mutation. Uh, we're going in with a knockdown approach. Again, similar to Friedrich's ataxia, direct to the CSF dosing, uh, intrathecal delivery. So a group of you know, very severe disorders, high unmet medical need, and um, really enthusiastic about uh, bringing these forward uh, for patients. As we think about uh, potential future discovery projects uh, for the company, two key points we like to make. One is uh, there's going to be some key learnings that we're going to um, make off of uh, the lead product programs, and we'll look to apply those learnings in you know, Voyager product programs four, five, and six. So direct injection into the brain parenchyma from a Parkinson's disease perspective could be applicable uh, in the um, uh, Huntington's disease arena. As we think about a monogenic ALS SOD1 approach, if you swap out out, uh, for a different transgene, uh, you, could e you could leverage that in, in areas um, or, or apply that in areas of other forms of monogenic ALS. That's kind of piece one. Piece two is while we're um, laser focused on CNS right now from a strategic perspective, we appreciate that um, the investment that we're making on the product engine certain, certainly has applicability across therapeutic uh, indications. So uh, we're keeping that in mind in terms of the long-term strategy of the company, but also as we talk to strategic partners, uh, this has been um, an area that they're very interested in working with us on. So next slide is just a high-level overview of uh, the product engine. I've already mentioned the key pieces, uh, vector optimization and engineering. What we're doing here is really systematically looking at um, many of the known serotypes, some engineered variants that either our collaborators or we've discovered uh, in the laboratory, and systematically testing them in um, non-human primate screens, and really looking to identify variants that could be applied uh, to our lead programs from a CNS perspective. Bigger picture, what we're trying to do is better understand the structure activity relationship of the capsid and ultimately uh, the properties um, that are conferred uh, by the specific capsid sequence. These are things like tissue tropism, distribution in the body, uh, immunogenicity or, or lack thereof, um, with an eye towards being able to ultimately do rational capsid design. So have some kind of predictive value of if you make these manipulations in the capsid, uh, what characteristics does that confer? Um, uh, on the vector. Uh, process development and production I already mentioned, focused on high quality scalable cost effective methodology, uh, leveraging the, the baclovirus platform, and dosing and delivery techniques, imaging devices, et cetera, uh, are key areas of focus. I uh, always like to highlight uh, some of our key collaborations and, and license agreements. Some of these will, were put into place shortly before uh, we launched the company in February. Some were put into place uh, shortly after. Uh, University of Massachusetts Medical School has been a key collaborator for us. Obviously, two of our founders uh, come from UMass. Uh, we have a broad strategic collaboration with them that includes sponsored research, uh, preferential access to their AAV vector core uh, to um, have a research-grade virus supplied for our R&D studies. And then we also have an exclusive license agreement with them covering two main areas of IP. One is uh, novel AAV variants that Guangping has discovered in his laboratory. A uh, second key bucket is Phil Zaymore's microRNA technology uh, that we pulled down on an exclusive basis in the field of, of gene therapy. Uh, in early June, we announced um, a non-exclusive license agreement with Regenix. Uh, this covers their NAV vectors. So these are a number of the uh, wild-type serotypes that are currently uh, being developed, both from a preclinical and a clinical perspective. And we have rights to those vectors in, in certain CNS indications, specifically ALS, HD, and Friedrich's ataxia. Uh, we have a couple of different agreements with Stanford to bring in novel AAV variants that were identified uh, by Mark Kay in his laboratory. And most recently, we did a non-exclusive license agreement with NIH, brought in the foundational uh, baclovirus um, uh, IP rights. This was IP that was actually created by Rob uh, Cotton when he was there uh, as a senior investigator. 
So as we look at over, call it the next 12 to 16 months, um, what the key goals for the company um, are over that time frame, uh, looking to select the lead construct and complete IND enabling studies for our lead uh, Parkinson's program. Uh, we're also looking to uh, identify lead candidates for both our ALS and Friedrich's ataxia programs. And as part of the, the, the pipeline evolution process, really look to identify the next, um, next round of discovery projects that Voyager might pursue. Um, we'll look to complete our initial round of, of key product engine experiments in the early 2015 timeframe. These are the non-human primate screens, uh, looking at a number of the um, novel AAV variants and serotypes uh, that are currently available. And uh, we've been, you know, pursuing uh, strategic partners essentially since we launched the company, you know, well down the path in terms of negotiations, and we hope to have news on that front uh, in the not too distant future. So that's it. That's uh, the whirlwind tour of Voyager. Uh, I don't know if I have time for questions. I think I did okay on time. All right, thanks.